Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, AKA Stitcherista here on YouTube. And today is Sunday. I almost said February. Today is Sunday, March 19th. So, as you can see, we'll talk about the credenza here for a minute. I unboxed the credenza in a video on Friday. So if you haven't checked that out, check that out. Um, it finally came and I don't know if you can tell in this video, but the trays are really big and I don't mind that. I like it. I know some people do not like the larger trays. Um, I did get all of the diamonds in there on Friday evening um, from Queen of Hearts, but this is the first time I'm actually using the credenza. So since I'm doing a voiceover, I will have to give you my true opinion about how I like using it in Monday's video. Um, I will show you in Monday's video also what it looks like with the diamonds in it. And I got a lot of stitching done yesterday. I stayed up late, late Saturday night after Bill went to bed and caught up on Daisy Jones and the Six and then watched A Star is Born. I was up till like two in the morning and that's because I had a cup of coffee at 3.30. Don't do that, Danielle. No, 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 no. So, yeah, I didn't go to bed till like two. <laughs> and I just got back from the grocery store and got all that stuff put away. So now getting ready to do the true crime and diamond pain and all that good stuff. So, but another little piece of news. So when I got the credenza and I set it up next to the, there's like a little table connected to the drafting table. Bill and I were talking and I'm like, I'm going to need to figure something out where I can have it like next to me because where it's at now, I, I can open the doors all the way, but I have to like move it every time and I have to roll my chair over to get a tray out. So I tried to put the credenza on my drafting table. But because of the lip of the light pad, I couldn't open the door. And I thought, all right. Then I was going to take my Ikea cart that I have the lid on and just keep the credenza on top of that and roll the cart over each time. And Bill's like, you're going to hate that. So I'm like, okay, my only other option is to get a new desk. Now, the desk that I have is five years old and I didn't even pay for it. My dad had gotten me an Amazon gift certificate for my birthday and I used it because that drafting table at that time was only $75. It's like a hundred and something now. So I said, you know what I need? I said, I need a table. I need like one of those standing desks that has adjustable levels for the different parts of the desk. So I started looking. I tell you, I probably spent two hours yesterday looking on Amazon and I found a desk. It has three parts to it. The top of it, which, and all of it's height adjustable. The back, which is made for a computer monitor, but I'm gonna put the credenza on that so it's in front of me and it's gonna be so perfect. Then the bottom part, the one section tilts like a drafting table. And then the other part, there's like a little uh, table next to it, a little piece next to it that I can put like my drink, my phone. Oh my God. And it will match the color of the desk that my mom got me for Christmas that is currently in the craft room. So Bill and I talked for probably an hour about it because we measured, we looked at the measurements, made sure, measured my light pad, all of that, because this desk is $400. And I really balked at spending that considering what I had just spent on the credenza. And he said, look, we were just talking the other day about not buying crap anymore, like not buying a desk that's $90, but it's cheap and crappy. He said, just get it. So I ordered it and it's going to be here next Friday. So I'm really hoping it is going to be here Friday because we might put it together Friday night. 
Now, I told a handful of people, like my online friends, that I was getting it. And one person said, what are you going to do with your other desk? And Bill said, well, why don't we keep your other desk at least for like a couple days? Because what if you hate this new desk? Good point. I don't think I'm going to hate it. Just because I can adjust however my light pad, because I don't have the table angled too terribly high. However that's angled, I know I can finagle the back part to where the credenza is going to be at a good level. It's going to be amazing to have it directly in front of me where I will not have to turn my chair, move my chair, bend over, do nothing to get diamonds out. And the back part stays straight up and down because obviously you run the risk if you have this credenza on an angle of the stuff falling out of it. So yeah. Um, I promise in Monday's video, I will show a picture of the desk and I will, I will talk about it again briefly, but okay. So let's get into the true crime stories today. So this first one is called the killer upstairs. Let me take a drink real quick. It was the evening of August 2nd, 1991. And in Dallas, Texas, Felicia Prechtel was planning a rare night out. The 29-year-old single mom was devoted to her five-year-old five son, Chad. But just for tonight, she had arranged for her brother and his girlfriend to babysit the boy while she went out with friends. Chad, in any case, was excited to spend time with his uncle, Michael, especially when Michael announced a trip to the store to pick up some videos and snacks for the evening. It was around 6 when Michael, Shad, and Michael's girlfriend departed on their store run. Felicia stayed behind to finish her hair and makeup for her night on the town. She was thus engaged when there was a knock on the door. Dun, 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 right? Felicia vaguely recognized the man standing in the hall. She had seen him around the apartment complex. Now he introduced himself, saying that his name was Carl and that he lived upstairs from her. I was wondering if I could borrow some sugar, he said, tim timidly holding out a cup. Felicia, of course, said that he could and invited him inside. After filling his cup, she sent him on his way and got back to doing her makeup. But just a couple of minutes later, there was another knock. Setting aside a tube of mascara, Felicia went to answer it. Looking through the peephole, she was somewhat surprised to see that Carl was back. A short while later, Michael and Shad returned from the store. Shad was keen to show his mom the videos they had rented, but Felicia was in the bathroom with the door shut, the clothes she had picked out for the evening hanging in the hall. Shad and his babysitters went to sit in the lounge, but after several minutes, Michael began to become concerned about his sister. He went to the bathroom door and knocked, calling her name, and no reply came from within. He tried again, and nothing. Slowly, Michael eased the door open, warning his sister that he was coming in. I hope you're decent, he choked. He joked. Then he saw what was inside, and the words died on his lips. Can you imagine? You come in the apartment, and you think she's in the bathroom getting ready, and you're waiting 20 minutes, half hour, and the whole time she's dead. Felicia was lying face down on the bathroom floor, her jeans and underwear pulled down to her knees, her wrists and ankles bound with duct tape. A pool of blood was haloed out around her head, deep crimson against the white of the tile. Michael did not have to check for a pulse to know that there was nothing to be done. Shaken, stunned, and barely able to comprehend what had happened here, he pulled the door shut. Then he walked to the bedroom and called the police. Felicia Prechtel had been executed by a single 30 caliber bullet to the head, fired on a trajectory that suggested she had either been kneeling on the floor or sitting on the toilet when she was killed. Before that, she had been bound hand and foot and brutally sodomized. Lord, I... First off, how did no one hear the shot if this is an apartment building, right? But the killer had been far from careful. He had left behind a 30 caliber cartridge. He had left a fingerprint on the duct tape he had used on Felicia's wrists. He had left semen on his victim. What year was this again? 1991. 
Given that this was a murder committed inside a heavily trafficked area and within a defined window of time, given that it had been reported almost immediately, this looked like a very solvable case. However, as detectives started questioning residents of the building, they hit their first roadblock. No one had seen or heard anything. So, did he have a silencer on the gun? Like, a gunshot would sound definitely loud in an apartment building. Carl was questioned, of course, but insisted that he had been out walking his dogs, and this was confirmed by a neighbor. Carl made no mention of the cup of sugar he had borrowed from the victim that very evening. Next, the police turned to their forensic evidence. A DNA profile was extracted from the seminal fluid and submitted to CODIS, and no match. The fingerprint was run through the usual state and national databases, nothing. So in no time at all, the solvable case had run aground. I'm guessing eventually, because these are all cold cases that I read, I'm guessing eventually that Carl admits to the sugar, because how would they have known that? How would they know that he went there to borrow a cup of sugar? I guess we'll find out. So five years pass. Five years. In early July 1996, a man named Carl Chamberlain was arrested for an attempted robbery and abduction in Houston. Chamberlain was booked on the charge, and of course, he was fingerprinted. The minute those prints were entered into the system, they returned a match to the unsolved 1991 homicide of Felicia Prechtel. So I guess I didn't know that that's how CODIS worked, where if they enter stuff in, a, in the database... If your fingerprints aren't in there yet, but then you do a crime and your fingerprints are entered, it will bring up everything you've tested positive for. Interesting. Dallas PD detectives were stunned when they got the news. A quick review of the case file told them that Chamberlain had been a neighbor of Felicia and had been questioned during the original inquiry. That put him in the vicinity of the murder. Not just in the vicinity, but at the scene, binding the victim's wrists with duct tape. Carl Chamberlain was quickly tracked to the Dallas suburb of Euless and taken into custody on July 17, 1996. Questioned by detectives, he seemed almost eager to confess, although his version of events was dubious at best. According to Chamberlain, he had been drinking heavily that day and decided to visit his attractive neighbor on the pretense of borrowing a cup of sugar. Well, there's a piece of puzzle falling into place. Yeah, he would have had to tell them that. He said that Felicia was scantily dressed when she answered the door and claimed that she had flirted with him as she gave him the sugar. Even if she was, which, let's face it, are you going to answer the door scantily dressed? Highly unlikely. But just because you flirt with someone doesn't mean you're, it's an invitation to rape you. Nah. So he then went back to his apartment, but was sexually aroused by the encounter and decided to return. And when he did so, he was carrying an M1 rifle and a roll of duct tape. The end goal, I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, definitely premeditated. Chamberlain never could explain why he armed himself before he returned to Felicia's apartment. If it was to coerce her into having sex, that proved unnecessary. According, oh, get out of here. According to Chamberlain, Felicia consented to have anal intercourse. I don't believe it. However, once the act was done, she started threatening to tell his wife, and that was when he took the gun and shot her. Immediately afterward, he returned to his apartment and took his dogs for a walk to establish an alibi. Mm, now, sus. Police detectives deal with the very best liars in the business. It goes with the territory. I can't imagine, as a police officer how often you hear bull crap, like how often you hear people lying. Like Bill and I have watched the show Cops and we almost play a drinking game with it. Like how many people say, oh, it's not mine. Um, I don't have my license. Like there are things, like everyone lies, it seems. So over time, police develop near superhuman abilities for sniffing out untruths. In effect, they are human polygraph machines. But you didn't need any advanced skills to realize that Carl Chamberlain was lying through his teeth. Were the police really to believe that a young woman preparing for a night out and expecting her five-year-old son home at any time would consent to anal sex with a stranger who just showed up at her door? The story was just too ludicrous to warrant serious consideration. 
The far more likely course of events was that Chamberlain's sugar ruse was a scouting mission to establish whether Felicia was alone. Having determined that she was, he returned to his apartment to fetch the gun and duct tape, which he used to threaten and then bind his victim. So I guess his wife wasn't home because um, you would say, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. So having done that, he sodomized her and then shot her in the head. And that made sense. That matched the evidence, not the tall tale that Chamberlain was telling. Carl Eugene Chamberlain was indicted on capital murder charges in August 1996. In June 1997, he was found guilty as charged and sentenced to death. Of course, there was still the protracted appeals process to navigate. In Chamberlain's case, that would take 11 years before he eventually kept his date with the executioner on June 11, 2008. So, you know, it's hard for me to say whether I truly believe in the death penalty. I feel like when someone, like, I try to picture myself if one of my family members was killed, murdered like this. I don't think I would want them to be put to death instantly because I would, you know, I feel like people need to atone, right? Like, you would want him to be in prison or her in prison, and have to live with what they have done. Anyway, Chamberlain, though, appeared in good spirits as he was strapped to the gurney, smiling broad- broadly as he addressed Felicia Prechtel's relatives and told them that he loved them. Because by now, her son is like in his 20s at this point, okay? We are here to honor the life of, P- of Felicia Prechtel, he said, and to celebrate my death. I wish I could die more than once to tell you how sorry I am. He then admonished them not to have hate in their hearts, his words fading away in mid-sentence as the drugs took effect. Outside the prison gates, Chamberlain's supporters were in a less conciliatory mood. A group of 20 anti-capital punishment campaigners had gathered and were loudly protesting the execution with Chamberlain's mother at the forefront. Murina Author had traveled from Las Vegas, New Mexico, to participate in the protest. America is a fascist country, she shouted into a bullhorn. My son is a jewel. He is a teddy bear. He is not a bad man. Felicia Prechtel's family might have held a different opinion. And, you know, I can't imagine that if I had a child and they committed a heinous crime like that, that I would be able to just excuse it and say they're not a bad person, that they didn't do it. I don't know, though. Like, I, wow, what an awful story, but at least he was caught. Okay, we're going to do one more. Let me see how long this is. Wow, it's kind of a long one. Okay, it is called Late Night Caller. That reminds me, have you guys ever seen that movie, When a Stranger Calls? It's like from the 70s, late 70s. It's so good. The whole movie almost takes place like in the living room of this woman that's babysitting. And she keeps getting these creepy calls. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend. Okay, late night caller. Back in the early 70s, Buffalo, New York was a boomtown a center for steel manufacture with the mills running at full production. It was a magnet for laborers from across the country. There were jobs aplenty, money to be made. The steel workers worked hard and they played hard after hours. In the Riverside area of the city, where many of these men lived, there was a bar on every corner. They did a roaring trade every night of the week, no doubt. It is in the midst of this thriving community that we find Galen and Barbara Lloyd. Galen, known to friends and colleagues as Shorty, was a mill worker. His wife, Barbara, took care of the home and minded their two young children, Joseph, three, and Kimberly, just 14 months old. This, however, was not a harmonious union. Shorty was a boozer who usually hit the bars directly from work. Barbara, although a good mother to her children, also liked to party. And if local gossip was to be believed, she was liberal, lib, liberal with her sexual favors. Wow. Alrighty then. It all meant that the couple was frequently at each other's throats. Neighbors often heard raised voices and angry shouts coming from their apartment. 
On the evening of March 14, 1974, Shorty Lloyd left his job at the mill and followed a familiar path to one of his favorite watering holes. Shorty had a good excuse for needing a drink that night. He and his supervisor had exchanged words, and Shorty was convinced that the man was planning to fire him. In any case, Shorty hit the bottle hard, harder than even was the norm for him. He would visit 11 different drinking establishments that night, all of them within a short walk of his residence. 11? Good God. Eventually, at four in the morning, he staggered home. But Shorty had trouble getting into the house. He couldn't find his key, and banging on the front door, shouting Barbara's name brought no response from within. Eventually, he rounded the building. This brought him closer to the bedroom, so he hoped that he would be able to rouse Barbara from here. As it turned out, there was no need because the back door stood open. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, my. Under normal circumstances, this would have surprised Shorty. Barbara always made a big deal of locking the door at night, latching it from the inside. But Shorty's mind was muddled by booze. It did not even register with him that every light in the house was on. Do you know that country song? That reminded me of that. He staggered towards his bedroom, stopping briefly on the way to look in on his children. Joe and Kim were both sound asleep. Thank God. Then Shorty continued down the hall, stopping in the doorway of his room. The bed that he shared with his wife was empty. The bedclothes piled on the floor. Barbara, he slurred. That was when he spotted it, a pale hand protruding from under the comforter. It was at this point that Shorty's inebriated brain registered that something was amiss. Stepping forward, he grabbed a corner of the comforter and peeled it back. A jolt of adrenaline rushed through him, banishing the cobwebs from his mind in an instant. Barbara lay on the floor, her eyes staring blankly towards the ceiling, her upper body covered in blood. From the center of her chest protruded the handle of a knife. Shorty ran then, ran to his neighbor, Bob Innes, and pounded on his door until Bob opened. Call the police, he blurted. It's Barb. Someone killed Barb. I can't even imagine coming home and finding your spouse murdered. This was an incredibly savage murder. Barbara Lloyd had been butchered, stabbed 16 times in the upper body with a steak knife taken from her own kitchen. This had been wielded with such force that the blade had snapped off during the attack. Barbara had also been strangled, and the autopsy would reveal that she had been raped. Good night. Wow. Valuable forensic evidence was retrieved from the scene, including three pubic hairs found on the floor between the dead woman's legs. So right from the start, the police were certain of one thing. The person who had killed Barbara Lloyd was not a stranger to her. The fury of the attack suggested someone with a deep-seated anger. The fact that Barbara's face had been covered implied that the killer could not bear to look at her after the deed was done. Whoever had killed Barbara was someone she knew, someone with whom she had perhaps had a love-hate relationship. And who did that describe almost exactly? Gail, Gail and Lloyd, of course, her husband, right? There can be little doubt that Shorty loved his wife. In fact... His prodigi prodigious, yeah, prodigious alcohol consumption might have had something to do with her serial infidelity. Was it a stretch to believe that Shorty came home drunk, that he and Barbara got into another of their rows, and that he lost his temper and killed her? No, that was not a stretch at all. I don't think he did it, though. Just my spidey sense. Shorty would spend over 12 hours under police interrogation. During that time, he made some telling admissions. He admitted, for example, that he had almost killed Barbara the week before she died. The fuck? What? <laughs> According to Shorty, Barbara had gone out that night while he took care of the kids. He had dozed off and woken at 5.30, only to find that she was not yet home. You mean 5.30 in the morning? He had then gone to the window and looked out into the street where he spotted Barbara sitting in a parked car with his neighbor, Bob Innes. Ooh, maybe it's the neighbor. He had gone out and dragged her inside. Then the two of them got into it and he put his hands on her throat, choking her until she blacked out. 
I thought I had killed her, he told the cops. Now they wondered if Shorty might have gone one step further. Speculation, however, has never closed a murder inquiry. In truth, the cops had nothing on Shorty. Detectives had verified his alibi. Shorty was well known in the area and had been seen drinking all night at various bars. It wasn't a perfect alibi by a long shot, but it checked out. Shorty was free to go. Distraught at his wife's death, he sought solace in an old friend, the whiskey bottle. With their mother gone and their father in no condition to care for them, the children were sent to live with Barbara's sister, Linda, and her husband, Leon Rusty Chat. Rusty was an interesting character, one of the few men in the area who did not work in the steel industry. In fact, Rusty worked barely at all. He was a slacker, perpetually unemployed, usually scrounging for booze or money. He was also a ladies' man with a string of conquests around town. You know, here's what I don't understand about that. I don't know if it's just me, but if you are lazy and you don't have a job, what are you bringing to the table? What's the allure there for a woman, right? I guess if you just want sex, okay, but what? Come on, ladies. And if Rusty's charms failed to impress the object of his desire, then he was not adverse to applying a bit of physical pressure. One of the women who had attracted his unwanted attention was his sister-in-law, Barbara Lloyd. Barbara had confided in her friends that Rusty had once tried to force himself on her. When she resisted, he got physical and ended up ripping her blouse. According to those who knew Barbara, she was afraid of Rusty. And so Rusty was added to the list of suspects. Officers started talking to his drinking buddies and heard the same story time and again. It appeared that Rusty was obsessed with Barbara and that he often spoke about wanting to have sex with her. What the? What is wrong with these people? It was time to bring Rusty in for a talk. Rusty Chat's alibi for the night of the murder sounded a lot like the one provided by Shorty Lloyd. He too had been out partying visiting many of the same bars. He and Shorty had spent some time together in the latter part of the evening. Rusty had even taken Shorty to the home of one of his girlfriends, a woman named Darnell. Shorty had left him there and gone back to his binge. Rusty had spent the rest of the night, and Darnell, he said, would confirm it. And Darnell did back up Rusty's story, adding one detail that was of particular interest to investigators. She said that Rusty had fresh scratches on his back that night. Hmm, sus. This was one of two snippets of information that began to swing suspicion in the direction of Rusty Chat. The other was Rusty's attire on the night in question. Early in the evening, several witnesses reported that he had been wearing a blue shirt with a floral pattern. By the time he hooked up with Shorty, he was wearing a white t-shirt. So why had he changed? That was an interesting question, but it did not amount to evidence of murder. Six months in, and the police still did not have enough to charge either of their main suspects, and the case was going nowhere at this point. Rusty and his wife had left the area by then, and the children had been returned to the custody of their father. But Shorty continued to sink deeper and deeper into the bottle. Eventually, he lost his job and his children, who were placed in foster care. Meanwhile, the murder of Barbara Lloyd faded from the public consciousness. There seemed very little prospect that her killer would ever be caught. By 2003, Barbara Lloyd had been dead 29 years, and her case had been cold for almost that long. Her son Joe was now 32 years old, and her daughter Kim was 30. Still haunted by their mother's death, still desperate for answers, Siblings approached the Buffalo Police Department to ask if they would reopen the investigation. Buffalo did not have a cold case squad at that time, but they agreed, assigning Detective Dennis Delano Delano, to the task. The first challenge for Delano was to find the case file, which was buried deep in the archives, and that task alone would take him four whole days just to find the file. Once the files were located, though, Delano learned that there were two main suspects, Galen Shorty Lloyd and Leon Rusty Chat. There was also 
a biological sample lifted from the scene in the form of three pubic hairs. I had forgotten about that. The obvious next step was to extract a DNA profile from the hairs and compare it against the suspects. That might implicate one of them or it might clear both of them. Shorty Lloyd still lived in Buffalo and agreed immediately to provide a sample for testing. All these years he had lived under the shadow of suspicion with even his children wondering if he had murdered their mother. This was his chance at absolution and Shorty took it with both hands. The DNA test cleared him. So that was probably a huge weight lifted off of his mind and the children's minds. So that left Rusty Chat, who had long since left the area and was far more difficult to track. Investigators learned that Chat was now divorced from his wife, had lived in several southern states, and had served five years in Arizona for robbery. Then he dropped off the radar for a while before reappearing in Buffalo in the late 1990s. When detectives eventually tracked him down, he was living in a rooming house less than a mile from the apartment in which Barbara Lloyd had been murdered. So, it, you know, it must have been a considerable shock to Rusty when Buffalo PD detectives knocked on his door asking about a decades-old murder. Um, he probably thought he got away with it, if it is him. Rusty said that he knew nothing about it and refused to submit to a DNA test. Right there. If you know you're innocent, why wouldn't you submit to it? Then he closed the door in the officer's faces. But Rusty should have known that the cops were not going to give up that easily. For weeks, they tracked him until Rusty made the ill-advised move of hawking up a wad of, wad of phlegm on an icy sidewalk. Wow, are you serious right now? That was scooped up into an evidence vial and sent to the lab for testing. It would be two months before the results were in. The next time that Buffalo PD knocked on Rusty's door, it was with an arrest warrant. Rusty Lloyd, of course, had an obvious defense. At trial, his attorney offered the thesis that Rusty had consensual sex with Barbara on the night she died, but that he was not her killer. That, attorney Joseph Terranova suggested, could only be one man, her husband, Galen Lloyd. The argument was enough to convince one holdout juror, resulting in a mistrial. Oh, boy. Second time around, the prosecution case was more persuasively presented. According to the prosecutor, Chat had spotted Gail and Lloyd drinking in the bar that night. So, realizing that Barbara would be home alone, he had gone to her house, determined to take what he had lusted after for so long. He had strangled Barbara into submission and raped her. Then, to cover up the rape, he had stabbed her to death. Barbara had scratched him during the assault, and those scratchers would later be noticed by Chat's girlfriend. He had also gotten blood on his shirt, which was why he had changed it. Finally, he had sought out his brother-in-law, Shorty, and spent the next few hours drinking with him to establish an alibi. Barbara Lloyd had turned down Rusty Chat before, the prosecutor stated in summation, so why on the night she was murdered would she suddenly consent to have sex with him? The simple answer was that she hadn't agreed. Chat had forced her and then killed her to ensure her silence. It was the only explanation that made sense. March 14th, 2008, marked 34 years to the day since Barbara Lloyd's murder. It was also the day that the jury returned a unanimous guilty verdict to the charge of second-degree murder. Rusty Chat was subsequently sentenced to 25 years to life. Chat was 67 years old on the day he entered prison, so when he committed this, 31. 31 years old. No, 33. Yes, 33 years old. So Chat was 67 years old on the day he entered prison, and he will likely die behind bars. Um, Yeah, probably. So, you know, I'm guessing, you know, some of these cold cases, yeah, that he probably thought he got away with it. 30 years later? Yeah. But I really like reading the cold cases if I'm going to read any true crime because at least you know they are solved. I really don't like the ones that are unsolved. It just, it bothers me. But I hope you enjoyed seeing me do some diamond painting and reading some true crime stories. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing, and I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.